Hi, I'm Chris Lovett and I work in the Microsoft Research Lab in Redmond. In this webinar, I'll explain the Coyote project and walk through some example code. Coyote is a .NET framework and testing tool that can help you solve problems with concurrency and non-determinism in the state machinery of your code. This project is uh, brought to you by these three people, Fantasies and Akash, and uh, the code is available on GitHub. Software developers are struggling to manage the complexity of their code, especially as things are becoming more and more asynchronous. Also, as we move into the world of microservices, engineers are being asked to ship more frequently in a world that is more and more distributed. At the same time, this complexity results in more bugs. And as businesses, including Microsoft, deliver more of their mission-critical systems in the cloud, bugs in this code result in serious revenue loss. So this makes it even more critical that we do everything we can to improve the state of the art for engineering these systems. Coyote guides developers into building rock-solid, highly parallel code. Let me illustrate. This animation shows messages passing through a highly parallel distributed system. Each node represents a microservice or a piece of code running on some machine. Messages are flying through the system in a way that makes it really hard to debug when something goes wrong. Coyote tests one async path at a time, exploring all possible paths through the system, and it does this very quickly. It also records this path so that when it finds a bug, that bug is 100% reproducible. That's still pretty abstract, so let me show you something that is a real system. This is an implementation of a complex fault-tolerant cluster protocol called Raft. Here you see five servers in green all communicating with each other as they implement the protocol to elect a cluster leader. Each server runs in parallel with respect to the others so that the messages are flying around as you can see here. As you can imagine, this sort of thing is really hard to debug. Coyote can help break this down into something that's testable and debuggable. First, you use the Coyote framework to declare your message types and your state machines, which are the groups here, and the states inside each machine. So we see four states here. You also declare what are the valid events that can be received in each state. Then you write a Coyote test and run it using the Coyote test tool. In test mode, Coyote takes over control of all concurrency and non-determinism in your code and all possible timings of events in this asynchronous system. And let me show you what that looks like again. If I play that, you can see it playing one message at a time. So Coyote is able to test your system one message at a time and visualize the results. This is one test iteration containing one specific ordering of thousands of messages through the system. In this case, Coyote found a bug where two of the servers in this cluster become the cluster leader at the same time, and that's these red nodes here, which is actually a problem that violates the protocol. The really cool thing is that when Coyote found this bug, it also recorded the exact message ordering that was required to create that bug. So you can replay the bug instantly in your debugger and you can actually debug it without a million different threads going on at the same time. So when you use Coyote to build these kinds of distributed applications, you get for free a powerful testing tool that can intelligently test your code and find bugs automatically. Even better, when Coyote found a bug like this, it's also 100% reproducible. The animation you just saw is also greatly slowed down, just so that we can see what's going on here. The Coyote tester itself can run hundreds of these iterations per second, making it possible to search the enormous space of possibilities to find even the most difficult bugs. So this is like a search problem, and Microsoft Research has provided some built-in search algorithms to help narrow down the search for bugs. 
These have been tested and verified with real customers working on large code bases. So who's using Coyote? Several teams in Azure are using Coyote to build their production services already, including various teams in Azure Batch, Azure Blockchain, and Azure Compute. For example, a team in Azure Batch is using Coyote to be able to check the correctness of their failover logic. And the Azure Batch team has over 100,000 lines of code using Coyote Framework. Another team in Azure Compute used Coyote to help them move to a much more responsive and asynchronous design, which enabled the Coyote lock-free event-based actor programming model. And uh, they actually got not only a um, better system using Coyote and a, a system they could debug more easily, but their final system actually performed better as well, which is really interesting. All these customers are reporting significant improvement to productivity and confidence that their systems are ready for production each time they make a change. So, Coyote provides two programming models. One is based on the task programming model, which is built on the .NET Framework task platform. The second programming model is a more advanced actor programming model using events and state machines. And I will show you both of these programming models with some examples. First, the task model. This programming model offers a task type that serves as a drop-in replacement for the native .NET system threading task. Tasks represent an asynchronous operation and integrates really nicely with the C-sharp feature async and await. In production, a Coyote task executes with the same semantics as the .NET task. In fact, it's a very thin wrapper around the native task, which means it has a very minimal overhead in production. During testing, however, is where the magic happens, and Coyote can take over the execution of all tasks during the test and can explore various different interleavings between the scheduling of all those tasks to help find bugs. This model is in preview and is available right now. So let's take a look at some code that uses the task programming model. As is always the tradition with this sort of thing is to show the simplest possible Hello World tasks example. This code is available in GitHub. So I'm going to go over there. I have the repo right here. And I'm going to load Hello World tasks. Into Visual Studio. All right, here we see a simple console application with a program and a main entry point. And we see that we have a class called Greeter. The greeter looks like a normal C sharp class with an async method called write with delay async. It simply sets a member field after some delay as the setter. The run async method starts five separate tasks on purpose to make them run in parallel, calling that async method. Then it uses this construct here on task to wait for all five of those tasks to complete. Then it writes out the final value that was set. Clearly this is setting up a race condition where the value will be randomly set to one of these two different strings depending on which task gets scheduled last in this, op in this parallel operation. So to finish this sample we write an assert here in this case, we wrongly assert that the final value after running these five tasks will always be hello world. Clearly, that's not always going to be true because we have one that sets it to good morning. So we've injected a bug into this code on purpose. And let's run it and see what happens. So I went ahead and built that. And let me run this version here. In window. Right off the bat, it hit the bug, but let's run it again and again and again. You can see it sort of randomly succeeds or fails, depending on that thread scheduling. 
So this is basically the definition of a non-deterministic bug. And you'll see that the Coyote website talks a lot about non-determinism because that's one of the things that Coyote can be really good at helping uh, you test. So what I'm going to do is show you how to run this program in the Coyote test tool. But before I do that, let me just show you what, how that's going to work. Back in the main program, you'll see that there's a Coyote test attribute on this execute method. This test attribute allows the Coyote test tool to test this program in a special test mode. The Coyote test tool lives in the Coyote repo. If you built the uh, Coyote source code, this is building the Coyote project from source. And what we see is it's building all of the Coyote runtime projects here including the Coyote test tool that we're going to use to test our Hello World application. There's the Coyote test tool being built right there. That's the one we'll use. Great. Now we go back to the samples folder. We're going to use that Coyote test tool. If you just hit enter here, it shows you all the command line arguments that you can pass to this tool including what you're testing, uh, which is passed as an assembly path. So we're going to test what we just built in the bin folder. We have to pick the same .NET platform, .NET 4.6, Hello World Tasks, and we'll do 100 test iterations, and we'll see if it can find a bug. So. As expected, because the bug was hard-coded into this program, when we run this in the Coyote test tool, we need a bunch of iterations, which is what I passed in the command line there. And then it hits the bug. So it did seven iterations in this case. And then it found a bug, which is reported, found one bug. And it provides a log file that tells you exactly what happened when that test failed. So let's look at that. Here, you can see the log file says the value was good morning instead of hello. That's because of the failed assert. It also gives you the stack trace of where that bug was found in your program, which can be handy. Now, the interesting thing is that it also provides a schedule on uh, how it created that bug. And this is where the real magic happens with Coyote. So this is what you can do is you can actually, instead of test is a sort of search for bugs, but you can replay that schedule. Replay will jump straight to the bug. So you say replay. Oh, I have to give it the schedule. And instantly it found the bug. It didn't have to search this time. It's actually got the bug already. I can even run that with a break command, which will put us on a breakpoint inside Visual Studio, and uh, we can start debugging this thing with 100% certainty that that bug will happen. So this is really huge. For, for those of you who've spent way too much time you know, debugging uh, these sorts of problems with multi-threading, it can be extremely time consuming. I've spent you know, days trying to find a really nasty multi-threading bug. And Coyote actually makes these things debuggable you know, quickly, 100% reproducible, uh, super useful uh, feature of Coyote. There are some challenges with tasks, which I'll, I'll walk through here, which is that um, when you write more code, let me go back to Visual Studio, when you write a bigger program, uh, like the coffee machine example that we'll look at in a little bit, Oftentimes, you'll find yourself, especially if you have a lot of multi-threading going on, you'll find yourself having to use the lock statement with some sort of sync object, and you now have to you know, protect the update of local state uh, from multi-threading issues. Well, the lock statement is interesting. If I call out to some other method, I now have to worry about deadlocks. If I had call a method and that method starts another async task that and waits for it, that async task then calls back to, into this object and that tries to lock, 
I have a deadlock. Deadlocks are also difficult to debug. So uh, the other thing is that when you have all this async code and you need locks, you can't use the await keyword inside. In fact, the IntelliSense is not even letting me because it's not allowed. You're not allowed to use await inside a lock because that can be also a guarantee for deadlocks. So there are some non-trivial aspects to writing thread-safe code uh, that you run into if you have a lot of parallel tasks in your programs. Deadlocks, can't use async, and you have to protect your, your state. So async methods are a powerful feature of c -sharp. Async await is a really cool thing, but you have to be careful. Um, there are complications. So this leads us to the other programming model that Coyote provides, which is an actor-based programming model. And there's actually a lot of computer science research into actor programming models that show some great advantages of using this model. The first thing that we do with actors is you cannot call them directly. You have to send events to them, and uh, that goes through an inbox. So each actor has an inbox. It's kind of like email, right? So you, you send a message to an actor. And you cannot call methods directly on the actor. The only thing you have is an ID, which is the uh, thing that you need to send a message to an actor. That's the actor ID. And an event is like, think of an event uh, as, as a bundle of method parameters uh, that are wrapped up in an object called an event. And that's what you send to the actor. But that event, then, is something that can live outside of any call stack, unlike method parameters that are always on a call stack. An event can just live forever in an inbox, independent of call stacks. There's a lot of information on Wikipedia about this programming model and how it came about. It's very popular in the dis world of distributed systems. So events can also easily be serialized uh, to create a distributed system. So now your events are actually going across the wire to other systems. So. What we do with actors in Coyote is we run each actor in a separate thread or task, but the actor only dequeues and processes one event at a time, which means the actor internal implementation doesn't need to worry about multi-threading. So we don't need to do any locks, which is why we, we, we said that Azure Batch got a performance improvement, because they were doing lock-free programming, basically and the uh, parallelism happened at a higher level. Instead of doing parallelism at the method level, you're doing it at the actor level. That actually greatly simplifies your programming model. It's a little bit similar to ASP.NET that says you can process one HTTP request at a time. Here, an actor processes one event at a time. That's a lock-free programming model. So let's take a look at the simplest possible actor program. Hello world. So again, that's uh, here in GitHub. And we'll load that into Visual Studio. Hello world actors right here. Has a very similar program with a main entry point and a greeter class, except this time the greeter class is an actor. And you can see that this actor is provided by the Coyote actor namespace. So with actors, you declare what types of events can be received with a custom attribute. This says that the greeter is expecting to receive a request for greetings in this event type. So what we can then do is go to the definition of an event. Event is also provided by the Coyote namespace. And here, you can put data inside your events. So here, we've got one piece of data that we're sending, which is the ID of the caller. So the caller is calling the greeter, requesting that the greeter return a greeting. The greeter will return this event down here, which is another event which contains a greeting, just as a string. So this is how you bundle these events into you know, various event objects and you can now send them to the actor. So you declare what type of event you can receive or handle. So this actor can handle request greeting events. And this tells you 
uh, tells Coyote what method to call when that event is received. So it's going to call handle greeting right here. And we can cast that back to the type we're expecting. And we can pull the, uh, we can create a, a greeting using a random choice between hello world and good morning. So this is actually going to choose randomly between those two. Random number generation is also provided by the actor base class because Coyote wants to actually be involved in the generation of random numbers at test time. The greeter then simply does a send event to send the greeting back to the caller, which is provided in this event. And with a chance of 1 in 10, so that's what uh, random boolean 10 means, a 1 in 10 chance, it's going to send a second greeting, and this is our bug in this case. We're injecting a bug in here on purpose that sends too many greetings back to the caller. All right, so how do you test an actor? Over in the program, we have another class called a test actor. And the test actor is going to act like a client, if you like, of the greeter. So the test actor has to call, has to create the greeter and call send event requesting a greeting. So this is how we test our greeter by creating the actor. Again, what we get back here is not an instance of a C sharp object. We don't ever have permission to see the real instance of this object that's created by the Coyote runtime. And this ensures a proper decoupling between your various actors and, guarantee, and is able to then guarantee this thread safety that we talked about and that only one message is handled at a time. So what I get back is an actor ID. That actor ID is then what we use to send an event. And here we're going to send up to five random number generation, you know, one plus random to five. So we should send one to five messages here uh, to that greeter. And we'll store in this little variable here, count how many greetings we sent. Now, notice that the test actor is also an actor, right? So just like the greeter, this test actor tells Coyote with a custom attribute what kind of events it can receive which is this greeting event. And when it receives a greeting event, call the handle greeting method. The handle greeting method is down here. We're able to cast that back to greeting event, and we decrement the count. So here we're actually going to start uh, writing some test code. We will decrement the count and uh, print out what the greeting was, just so we can see it in the log. And we're going to assert that this count never becomes negative. If it does, then we have a problem that there are too many greetings returned. Of course, we have injected a bug in here on purpose that will return too many greetings. And so with, with a 1 in 10 chance, this program should report that error. So we'll go ahead and build that. And we'll run that version. I'll just bring it over to our console window. Run it like this. When you run a Coyote program like this, outside the Coyote tester, we call that running in production. This is exactly what you would do with a production Coyote program. You just run it like any other c -sharp program. Coyote is just a, a library that is loaded in the process. So we've run it once. We've run it twice. This time we got five greetings. And so far, we haven't seen that bug, because there's only a 1 in 10 chance we'll ever actually get that bug. In fact, there we go, finally. So I had to run it a lot of times manually. So this is the thing with non-determinism. You'll typically find yourself having to run a lot of iterations before you actually trigger the bug that you're looking for. And then when you get the bug, how do you reproduce it? It's so hard to reproduce in the first place. All right, so let's run this in Coyote. I did with the other one. We'll run Coyote test. And we have to have the same .NET platform, so we'll run the 4.6 version. We just ran one iteration, but let's run 100 iterations. Oh, found the bug right away in that case, but let's do it again. 
And again, you can see it's finding the bug really quickly every time I run this. And again, as before, there's a log file. This time the log file is a little bit more interesting because it's showing you more of the Coyote actor runtime activity, including uh, messages when they are uh, sent. So we can see a whole bunch of send operations. And then as the messages get dequeued and uh, executed by an action on the greeter. So this is the handle greeting action. And then finally, we see the assert, too many greetings returned, which was triggered by that assert. Again, we can replay this as well, just as before, and we can get the 100% uh, reproducible bug. Now, um, let's take a look at a bigger example. We have the coffee machine example, where we also have an asynchronous version of the coffee machine up here on GitHub using async tasks right here, and you can look into that um, in your own time. But if you check out the code, you'll see that the task-based version of the coffee machine is using a lot of locks and even needs async locks in order to get its state uh, correct. The actor version is lock-free, and that's the one I want to look at in a little bit more detail here. So what is this coffee machine example about? The coffee machine example shows you how to build a state machine. So Coyote actors not only provide an actor model, but they provide a first-class state machine model. So this is a fun little coffee machine that I have in my kitchen. And oh, that reminds me, I need some coffee. Very good. Um, and it has a state machine. So what does it do? That coffee machine, first of all, when you boot it up, it checks the state of everything. What's the water level? What's the coffee level? And um, and it has a water heater, of course. It's got to heat up its water so it can make steam. And it's monitoring that. When it's ready, you can press the Make Coffee button, and it'll run the grinder, which will grind the beans. It will then fill up that little filter thing that, that pumps the water through, starts making shots. The shots come out at the bottom. And, of course, some things can go wrong, as in always with machines. So uh, you can run out of water, and a refill is required. And this machine, it's obviously you need a manual refilling process for both for coffee beans and for water. And uh, otherwise, it, if everything's good, it can clean itself up and go back to the ready state. This is all implemented in the coffee machine example using Coyote Actor Programming Model. Let's take a look at that in Visual Studio. Machine Actors. All right, so the coffee machine actors has a coffee machine, and this is a new concept in Coyote that I haven't talked about yet, which is state machines. A state machine in Coyote is a special type of actor that understands all of those states that you saw in that state diagram. Now, in a state machine, what you do is you declare, so it's also declarative, you declare the states of the machine with a class that's, that inherits from the Coyote state base class. State is a nested class inside state machine. So this is telling Coyote that this class has a state called check sensors. Now, remember with, act, with actors, regular actors, these were all at the class level. But now with state machines, we can move that down into the state level. So for each state, you can declare what events are valid. What can you do when you're in that state? You can also tell Coyote to defer certain states. So don't try to make a coffee yet because we're not ready. You can also have a special event that happens when we enter this state. So this is like a setup piece of code that happens when we enter the check sensor state. What do we do? Well, what can we do with, with actors? We can send events. So what do we do? We send events to the coffee grinder, and we tell it to turn off the coffee grinder. We turn off the water pump. We turn off the water heater. Uh, we also read, send some read events over to those various sensors to read the water level, read the hoppy level, because we want to make sure at the beginning of this state machine that every, all the sensors are in a good state, that we actually have water, that we can make coffee, and so on. So since we sent these read requests, that's why we're getting back four read responses, basically. These are the four events that we're expecting back 
These can all happen completely asynchronously depending on thread scheduling, uh, but uh, our code is, is handling those events. So here's an example of uh, when we get back the water level, we handle that right here. We get a water level, we store it in a local member variable, we print it out, and we check to see if the water level is empty. If it's empty, then we have to go to a different state. And here you can see a, a more state machinery showing up where we tell Coyote that we're going to transition to a different state. This can be done either in code, and it can also be done declaratively. I don't think there's an example of that on here, but um, let's see. On event go to, right? There's a declarative way of saying, when the make coffee, if we're in a ready state and somebody presses the make coffee button, then uh, we can just go straight to the make coffee state. So this is something that's completely handled by the Coyote runtime. Is we don't even have to write any code to do that state transition to making coffee. And then when we start making coffee, that's when the really interesting stuff happens. We grind the beans, we go into grinding bean state, and so on and so forth. So you can see how that state machine is progressing uh, throughout this code here. The uh, sensors then is, is, this is called mock sensors because this is not the real machine. Obviously, this is not the actual firmware of the, of the real machine. This is, this is built just for testing. Um, we have monitors, which I'll get into in a little bit, but we have the door sensor, we have the water tank, and these are all just simple actors. These, these are simple enough that it didn't need to use the state machine model. It can just be a simple actor. So the water tank can uh, register a client that it can talk to. It can read the water level, as you saw earlier. You can read the water temperature. You can actually turn on the water heater. Um, and there's a timer concept. So uh, Coyote actors also support timers, which is a callback, a you know, frequent callback event that can happen uh, automatically. And then you can pump the water to make a coffee and so on and so forth. There's another timer involved there. So this is a, an example of a mock implementation of an actor that's implementing the uh, logic behind the sensors and the hardware of the coffee machine. The coffee machine class then is more like the CPU of the coffee machine. It's the thing that coordinates all that hardware and makes the machine actually work. Now, upper level here, we have a failover driver. So this sample is uh, more than just showing you how state machines work. This sample is going to do one more really interesting thing. To test that our code is ready for prime time, we're going to reboot the coffee machine. So imagine if the little tiny CPU inside the coffee machine glitched out and rebooted halfway through making a coffee. What bad things could happen with that? And uh, obviously, if you're not careful in how you write that code, uh, it could do all kinds of silly things. Uh, and then what we do is we have some assertions in the code, uh, things that we want to verify never happen. For example, do not turn on the water heater if there's no water. Uh, bad things could happen. Burn down your house. Do not uh, turn on the coffee grinder if there's no beans in the hopper. Uh, can that, that can ruin the, the grinder. Um, don't try to make a shot if there's no water, and so on. Uh, there's also a safety feature. If the door is open, the machine has to not do anything, right? Don't want fingers getting stuck in there. So these are safety asserts that you'll see throughout the sample code and shows how Coyote can help ensure that these asserts are always true during testing, even during failover testing. So we're going to boot up one coffee machine. It's going to get halfway through its process, and then we're going to kill it, just like that. And then we're going to start another coffee machine. And what this test is proving is that the code is, is hardened to fail, handle failover nicely. The new coffee machine, when it boots up, needs to verify all of the sensor states, relearn what's happening, and make sure it doesn't do something silly. When you build this program, it's still just a, a very simple console program. And we get this here. And there'll be a bunch of print statements that show you what the coffee machine is doing. If we run that over here, all right, right off the bat is we can see that it detected that the door was open. Great. So the door was open, which you can see in red. Um, the mock sensors, because those are test classes, do actually initialize the machine with random states. So the door sensor randomly chooses to be open or not. 
uh, the water levels are randomly set and uh, the temperatures are set, the coffee levels are random. And that also helps the uh, testing of this program discover more of these fault cases. So that was interesting. We hit the uh, we hit the error case right off the bat. This time, this time it's off and making coffee. However, we started off with random water levels and hop, uh, coffee levels that were very low. So these are very low numbers. It did heat up that water, which is fun, and it uh, started making coffee. So it started grinding beans and started filling up the porter filter, but then it ran out of coffee beans halfway through. So automatically it went to an error state at that point. The coffee machine is done. Uh, there's nothing more can be that you can do with this test uh, without restarting the test um, until we manually refill the coffee machine. Let's see if we can find a run that actually goes all the way to making coffee. Nope, that one's empty. <laughs> and this one looks good. It's got the higher higher levels there. So it's making shots and it makes the coffee. Great. All the way to three shots completed. So the first round of running that coffee machine worked. Now remember, all the events flying around between the uh, coffee machine and those mock sensor uh, hardware objects are all asynchronous. So this is a very asynchronous program. All right, so it will keep running until it runs out of resources. But the question now is, how can we test every possible interleaving of all of those events and see if there are any bugs in the code? We actually did inject a bug in the code, and we haven't hit it yet. Uh, in fact, you can run it like this all day long, and you'll probably never hit the bug that we've injected in the code. So um, again, we'll run this in the Coyote test tool to see what happens. Coyote test tool has some more options besides iterations. I can also tell it what are the max steps. So for each iteration, you can explore it. But what if your program is just an infinite program? You have to tell it to stop somewhere. Otherwise, the Coyote tester will just get stuck in exploring an infinite state of, of, of transitions. And so what you can do is you can say max steps. And let's say max steps is 500. There's no more, you know, no point testing more than 500 events at a time for each iteration. You can also use different scheduling algorithms. So Coyote, like remember I said that uh, Microsoft Research has built some uh, a bunch of different search algorithms. And you can actually specify the search algorithm that you want to use in a test. And this is called PCT. There's a lot more documentation on that online, what that means. But I'll go ahead and run that. So here it is, setting up everything, iteration one, two, three, four, and it found a bug. All right, surprise, surprise. I know, we put it in on purpose. Let's take a look at the log file. And now, this is more interesting. This is a real system. This is not just Hello World. And so what we see now, as I page down here, is you know 600 events before we found a bug. And this triggered. An, this was an assert that triggered that said, "Please do not turn on the grinder if there's no beans in the in the hopper." So, with this failover experiment where we killed one machine, started another machine, we're making coffee all throughout this, we actually found a bug where it did try to turn on the grinder when there were no beans. Uh, so there is definitely a bug in here. So the fun part of this exercise then is to try to find that bug. Um, I'll let you do that in your own time. The other thing you can do with this test is you can ask for a graph. Now I'm going to ask for a graph of just the one iteration that contained the bug. And because of all of that declarative state machinery around uh, states and events that can be received and so on, there's a very cool feature that's provided by Curity, which is producing a DGML diagram. DGML can be uh, visualized using Visual Studio. So here we go. This is a visualization of all the states and state transitions that happened. I'm going to press Control A to see everything that happened here. So we can, all of these links that are connecting these nodes are messages that flowed across these actors and state machines. You can see that a coffee machine was created here, number five. And it went all the way through making, grinding, making shots, and cleaning up. So this actually completed a full iteration of making coffee. Then it was halted by the failover driver. Remember, we said we we're going to kill the coffee machines. Here, we've killed the coffee machine, and we create a new one. The new coffee machine started up and went all the way through to grinding beans, where it hit the assert that said, hey, hang on, there's no beans in the hopper. So uh, that's the bug. It should never have gotten that far. It should have got to check sensors, and check sensors should have said, hey, there's no coffee beans. So what happened? Um, but this helps us visualize uh, what's going on here. And in fact, the diagram uh, animation that I showed you on the web page uh, 
with the wrapped protocol was built from these diagrams. All right. So this is also a super useful way to just look at the design of your program, to communicate that design to other people on the team, and to you know visually see what's going on in a complex system, which can also be very useful. So you can see now that Coyote is more than a test tool. It's it's a test tool that integrates with your development process by providing frameworks and uh, uh, declarative ways of declaring states and so on. And it integrates with your design process in the sense that you can now see what your program is doing and reason about it. I glossed over quickly in that state machine example, there is also a monitor. And the monitor is a type of state machine that is um, a passive listener in a sense that a monitor can receive events, but it shouldn't be sending events to other parts of the system. So it's just there. Uh, oftentimes, you'll run monitors only at test time and not at production time if you don't want the overhead of monitoring stuff. And the monitor is something that Coyote uh, also supports some really cool concepts, including a liveness monitor. And let me show you the code for that. We have a liveness monitor in the coffee machine. And what does that mean? What are we looking for with a liveness monitor? A liveness monitor is something that has cold states and hot states. And these are two custom attributes that are only available on monitors. And Coyote will make sure that your monitor doesn't get stuck in the hot state. What this means, the way this is going to be used in the coffee machine, is we're trying to verify that the coffee machine always gets the job done. With async programs where you can easily get stuck in this circular event storms, and this guy sends an event, which sends an event, which sends an event, and you get this big you know, ladder effect, it's sometimes hard to prove that your program is ever actually going to finish. And I've actually seen this, program, this problem happen with real commercial large systems where they get stuck in event storms and they never finish the job. So it's a hard problem. So the liveness monitor is a tool that you can use with Coyote to verify that your machine always finishes the job. It has to either make the coffee or report an error that it needs refilling, but it, it should never get stuck in some intermediate state of just going round and round and round. And Coyote will actually verify this at test time, and uh, it has an algorithm that determines if it's spent too much time in, in the hot state, Coyote will raise an assert automatically saying, hey, you've got a problem. The door safety monitor is a different kind of monitor. It's not a liveness monitor, so it doesn't use hot and cold states. Instead, it's just a global um, thing that's monitoring uh, busy events from the coffee machine and the door open event. So it remembers if there's a door open event that we should go to the error state. And when we're in the error state, if we ever get any indication from the coffee machine that is doing something, then it shouldn't be, and that's an error. So we can assert right off the bat, hey, if the coffee machine started doing something while the door was open, this should never happen. And so that's uh, another way of writing monitors using Coyote. You can run them at test time, or you, some people actually do choose to run monitors in production as well. All right, so now let's move it up a level to something even more real. And this is the original example that I showed you, which is the implementation of the Raft cluster protocol. Okay, and uh, Raft is often used for fault-tolerant clusters. So what we've done in this example called cloud messaging is we've provided four projects that use Coyote. Here's a, actually, since we're on this page, I'll take the opportunity to show a classic uh, state machine here, all implemented with states. So now you can sort of, with a really clear glance at this code, you can see the kind of state machinery that's going on in this class. You don't have to kind of reverse engineer it by looking at all the member variables and how those member variables are sprinkled and around all of your code. It's a very clear declaration of a state machine. All right, so the uh, four projects in this solution, the Raft project over here is just the uh, C-sharp library that uses Coyote, doesn't know anything about Azure. It's a pure implementation of the Raft pr server protocol. So that's what this class is. And the Raft server is a state machine. But again, like I said, this doesn't know anything about Azure. It sends messages and uh, receives messages and implements the Raft protocol. You can see there's quite a lot of code here. Um, there is a really great website online that explains the Raft protocol, how it works. It's quite intricate. 
And um, of course, if you're building a fault tolerant cluster of services, you really want to know that that code is correct. So that's why it's really important to test this with Coyote. The how do servers talk to other servers? So in a true distributed system, um, you're going to have some sort of message bus. You're going to have some messaging system that can that send messages across machines. Now, Coyote is not in the business of providing a messaging platform. Coyote is not one of those things. It doesn't compete with service bus. It doesn't compete with any messaging system. Coyote is just an abstraction on top of that. So um, what we've done here is we've modeled the cluster concept the pub-sub concept, if you like, so a server can send a message to all the other servers is a pub-sub concept. We've modeled that as a state machine using uh, Coyote. So we've created this cluster manager, but this is going to be an abstract class with no implementations. You can see here that, that it doesn't actually implement anything. It's expected that either your test will implement something or your true Azure deployment will plug in here how to broadcast a vote request across uh, that pub subsystem. And in the uh, Raft Azure project, you'll actually see an Azure cluster manager that's implemented using the service bus topic client API. So if you're familiar with Azure service bus, it provides a concept of topics. Topics are a pub sub concept where you have a topic client that can send messages and you have a topic receiver, a message receiver in from the service bus that can receive those pub sub messages. So this is how we've plugged into uh, the Azure service bus. And when we receive messages, we can see we pa have to pass JSON, all that kind of stuff, that stuff Coyote doesn't care about. What really matters is at some point you get the Coyote actor runtime and you call send event. So there we, we, we've gone from send event out to a pub sub system. The pub sub system has brought that message back in and then we push it back into the Coyote world, if you like. So we've kind of plugged uh, Azure back into this Coyote world. But we've kept it a very clean separation. And the reason why that clean separation is good is when you get to the mocking version of this um, program where we want to test this thing. So the mock version has a mock client that sends events to the servers. So this is how we uh, request work to be done by that cluster. We have a mock cluster manager that doesn't know about Azure Service Bus. So the mock cluster manager is, is just a very simple, you know, broadcast is a very simple for loop over a list of servers where that list of servers is a bunch of actor IDs. So it's a for loop, just send it to all the other guys, um, except for us, you know, the guy who is sending this request. Um, and uh, so the, the mock implementation of the cluster managers all runs locally in the same process even or across, you know, if you run it locally, you can run it in multiple processes. But um, but this one is, um, is actually going to run the whole test in one process, which means that Coyote can run really, really fast. When Coyote is testing this RAF protocol, it doesn't have to wait for a service bus events, right? It can, it can run thousands of times faster in memory on one, one machine. It's also super convenient for a developer to be able to test all of their code in isolation on one machine uh, before they try to push it into production. All right, so let's go ahead and build that. And I won't run the Azure version because that needs a service bus account set up and all that kind of stuff. You can see there's a setup script that will do that uh, in the tutorial. You're certainly welcome to go ahead and run that, prove that it works with the Azure service bus, uh, provide the connection strings on the command line and so forth. But what I'm going to run is the mock version of this and see if it can find any bugs. This is actually a picture that uh, after I ran this, I was using the same um, graphing capability to sh look at what happened in the state machine at test time. So here you can see uh, this is actually a different type of graph that's called a coverage graph. So it doesn't show all five servers. Instead, it collapses each instance into one group to just show you code coverage. So it's kind of like showing you what, what are all the things that happened across all 100 or 1,000 iterations for testing this thing. And I'll show you how that works right here. So I'm going to run the same Coyote test tool. Except this time I'm going to use .NET 4.7. We can also support .NET Core, which means Coyote is also cross-platform. You can run that on any system that has .NET Core. 
And I'm going to test the bin net 47 raft.mock DLL. Now uh, I'm going to test a thousand iterations. Well, let's let's do a hundred iterations with max steps of 200 steps per iteration, and I'm going to request that coverage graph, and um, and that's activity coverage. So this is different from code coverage. It's a higher level concept of coverage, which is at that event level, were all the events that were declared sent and received by all the various places that said they could receive events. So it's like an event coverage graph. So it went ahead and it ran 100 iterations, didn't find any bugs in this case, which is expected because we didn't put any bugs in it yet. And, uh, and there's your diagram. And very similar to the version we saw before. Let me get rid of that. Uh, oh, okay. And control A, I can see events were sent across these things. So there's an event here. A state machine timer sent a time elapsed event. The cluster manager sent events, and so on. So the implementation of the RAF protocol does, in fact, involve these four states. And you can read about what those states mean on the web page description of this tutorial. Um, but you can see it's actually reaching all the states. Most importantly for this test, we want to see that one of the servers at some point reached the leader state. And this can also be a liveness problem if no servers ever reach the leader state, then it means they're just jostling and jostling and jostling for leader, but nobody's actually getting it. And that would be a liveness problem uh, with your cluster. So it's great to see that during this test, the leader state was achieved. All right. So remember, uh, Coyote can help you with non-determinism. So we have a fourth example uh, in a fourth project in that solution, which is called raft non-determinism where we can actually start to model some non-deterministic behavior. So oftentimes when you build a mock using Coyote, what you want to do is capture some of the weird behaviors of some external system that you have to deal with. And in this case, we've modeled a situation where uh, the non-deterministic behavior is that somewhere in our messaging system, whatever messaging system that is, we end up getting duplicate events. Uh, another thing you might model is events get lost and never get delivered. But in this case, we're going we're gonna to model the non-deterministic problem that we're struggling with is our system can't handle it when we get duplicate events. So let's take a look at that code just quickly. The way we do that in raft.nondeterminism is we inject a, a special implementation of the cluster manager where that cluster manager is going to randomly decide, based on this random Boolean, to send an event twice. So we get duplicates. Um, what's that going to do to the server? And is the server going to, uh, you know, the implementation of the RAF protocol going, going to be able to handle that without, without any problems? Um, and um, we can run raf.nondeterminism, just like before. And it's going to go ahead and search for the bugs. We've asked for 100 iterations. And we'll see what happens. 70, 80, 90. Oops, didn't find any bugs. Found zero bugs. All right, so what I happen to know uh, is that this bug is particularly hard to reproduce. The, In other words, the servers are, are quite good. The, the server implementation is, is really good. Uh, but it, I guarantee you there is a bug in there. So now I'm going to show you another feature of Coyote, which is that you can also ask for um, uh, a whole collection of different scheduling algorithms. Remember those search algorithms? Portfolio. So this is telling Coyote, don't just use one uh, scheduling algorithm, algorithm but Test, you know, throw, throw lots of different scheduling algorithms at this problem. And even better, let's run eight tests at once in parallel in different processes. So this is going to fire up eight processes on my box. And it's, it's probably going to kill my poor little laptop. Let's see what happens. And um, I'll ask for five then. And it's going to give each one of those processes a different random scheduling algorithm. And then we're going to search. So here we see it launching all five of those processes. 
and it starts firing up. It's got uh, probabilistic, it's got random, fair PCT. So there's your random selection of search algorithms, if you like. Off it goes, running, running, running. And it found no bugs. But the cool thing is, with these really hard bugs, I can increase the max steps and I can increase the number of iterations. I can, you know, Coyote's doing all the hard work for me. I can, I can run a million iterations and go have a coffee, right? And then come back and I've got the bug. And then I can tell my manager how wonderful I am that I can find bugs like that. It'll help your career. And um, I'll let that run off in the background and we'll come back and check it later and see if it found a bug. All right, so uh, that's the end of my talk. And uh, what we really want is your input on this. I think you'll agree so far that Coyote is a powerful tool. It can help you grapple with concurrency and non-determinism. It's available now both as a NuGet package and uh, as source code on GitHub. And uh, there's a, if you go up there and take a look at the website, you'll see that um, there are more examples as well, like this one, uh, robots. So if that's your, your fun topic, there's a really fun uh, tutorial here that will show you how we've used Coyote to help a robot navigate around a room. So that thing was running in the background, and it found a bug. And we can see that there's a log file. And this log file now woo, is huge. It contains 6,700 events. And it found a bug. And the bug is that there was more than one leader elected in the cluster at one time, which is breaks the protocol. Um, you can't have a fault tolerant cluster if two servers are competing for the same job. So um, there you see it found a bug. And we also see the replayable schedule. So again, uh, now in a real system, the replay feature becomes huge, right? So it took a long time to find this bug. But when I replay this using that replay schedule, using the replay command, it'll only have to run those 6,000 messages. So it should be a lot quicker than it was the first time. So it took 14 seconds the first time. Uh, the replay should be a lot quicker. And of course, with the replay, I can, I can put that in a debugger. I can put breakpoints everywhere. I can step through it as slowly as I want. I don't care, need to care about that interfering with the timing of everything. It will reproduce the bug, 100% guaranteed. And you can find the bug and, and fix it. We'll try to answer your questions and issues as quickly as we can if you post them up on the GitHub issues list. We also have a Gitter account there for Coyote and a Stack Overflow tag. So feel free, post your questions there. And um, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for joining the webinar. This is Chris Lovett. And I um, also uh, had a lot of help uh, during the question and answer time from uh, my colleagues, Akash and Pantazis. We got a lot of really good, deep questions today. So uh, I'll go over some of the most interesting questions that we saw. Um, the first one was, is this a testing tool or a programming framework? And that's a really great question because Coyote is, is this interesting thing that's both. It's, it's a programming framework that helps guide you in a way that uh, you create code that can be tested really well uh, using the Coyote test tool. I would go even further to say that Coyote is even a design tool because it gives you these visualizations and ways of, of looking at how your code is working. So that's a great question. Thanks. Thanks for that one. Another question that showed up quite a bit, uh, and we, we've heard this before, is what's the difference between Coyote, Orleans, and Service Fabric? Because they all seem to have this actor model. And uh, you know, so why do we have so many actor models is, is a common question. And the answer to that is that uh, Orleans and Service Fabric are much more than Coyote. Those are distributed runtimes. They actually will take the job of delivering messages over a distributed uh, network. 
they give you all of the machinery for reliable messaging for you know pub sub all that sort of stuff and coyote isn't any of that coyote is just a programming library uh, just like the task parallel library in the .NET frameworks it's not a distributed runtime coyote can be used actually inside of service fabric or inside of an orleans um, uh, grain you could actually use coyote's programming framework but uh, so, so they can be complementary. They're not. It's not. Coyote is not attempting to compete with Orleans or Service Fabric at all. Uh, Coyote is just about how you write your logic and how you test that. So let's see what other uh, interesting questions do we have here. I think uh, there was a great question about uh, the coffee machine, and and how to you know test. Uh, systems. The question was, why not test each individual machine in the coffee machine separately? Is the guidance that the test should serve to test an overall user scenario? So, by putting multiple machines together, and this is this is uh, you know the answer and what you saw during the webinar, uh, you can test how those machines are actually interacting with each other. So you actually get a deeper sort of test coverage of how you know events from one machine trigger state changes in another machine. And uh, so that gives you actually a more interesting test. You can test each machine independently if you want to, and by mocking everything else. In a, in a truly big distributed system, you probably need to do that, uh, where you focus on one part of your system and mock everything else. And you can actually use Coyote to, mock, to create those mocks. Uh, we actually do that in the Azure example, the um, cloud messaging example, we use mocking of the back-end service bus because you don't want to be running the Coyote test and, uh, and waiting for messages to be delivered through Azure. So you actually can mock out the service bus and test the logic uh, all in memory on your laptop. So uh, you, can, you can do it both ways. But we showed the coffee machine example that way. Um, because it it's, it's also shows the value of uh, being able to test multiple machines you know, in memory, exploring all of those state transitions. It becomes quite a large uh, state space to explore all of that, and Coyote can do that. So uh, another question was, there's a lot of mention of Azure. You know, I assume that we can run Coyote you know, on-prem as well, and uh, absolutely true. Uh, Coyote, actually, uh, the, if you look at the Coyote source code on GitHub, you'll see that there's zero dependencies on Azure. In fact, Coyote has a very small number of dependencies, and uh, we keep it that way on purpose because we want Coyote to be generally as useful as possible in as many different situations as possible. So Coyote has a very, very small number of dependencies, uh, just barely on top of the, the .NET frameworks. So, um, all of the demos that I showed in the webinar, in fact, were actually running on my laptop, literally, my Surface laptop right here. And uh, so you can certainly run Coyote uh, like that. And, and I think that's, that fits a developer's you know, uh, habits really well, because you want to be able to test and, and, uh, your system in isolation on your dev box and uh, get all of those bugs found before you push any code into a big distributed you know, online cloud system. So Coyote is designed to be used that way. All right, uh, let's see. One last question. Will Coyote be part of the .NET Framework release? Ooh. Um, can developers be assured it will be supported for the foreseeable future by Microsoft before they integrate it into their software? And this is, yes, this is a great question. Um, I would love to see Coyote integrated into the .NET Frameworks. Of course, I don't own the .NET Frameworks, so I cannot uh, make any claims that that will ever happen. Um, and uh, I think it would be awesome. Uh, if you think that should happen, maybe you should tell the .NET Framework team that's what you want. Um, but you know, obviously, the .NET Frameworks have to be extremely careful about what they put in there, because they, they do have to support it for all time. Um, so. While Coyote came out of Microsoft Research, it is actually in the process of, of an incubation process right now where it's actually being productized much more than most research projects. In fact, Coyote is heavily used by internal Azure teams, and, and so it's, it's probably going to stick around for a long time, just even if it's just because of that. But 
in reality, you know, uh, research is research. Uh, we can't guarantee that this will become a product like the .NET Frameworks. So that's one reason why we made it an open source project on GitHub. And that ensures that GitHub can take on a, a, a Coyote can take on a life of its own um, with an active community. The code is there. People can submit pull requests. We actually welcome that. We would love to see people uh, uh, submitting pull requests issues, uh, post issues up there, and you'll see us uh, responding to that as quickly as we can. Uh, we want Coyote to succeed. We want everyone to benefit from it, so we, we hope it sticks around for a long time. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap it up, and I'll thank everybody for joining the webinar. And uh, again, feel free to uh, participate with Coyote on GitHub. Thank you very much.